firefighters were busy evacuating Superior when they realized if the fire overran Town Hall, how would the town function when everyone got home? A significant shift in how we'll track COVID in Colorado now that the majority of COVID positive patients in hospitals aren't there because of the virus. The state legislature kicks off with bipartisan agreement on what the problems are. Six months later, Democrats appear to be on board with our three major issues. Countless Coloradans lost pets in the Marshall Fire or couldn't take their pets with them to temporary housing. Tonight is our chance to make families whole again. And they had nothing but an old couch left after the fire. Time for a photo session. Making the best out of what life deals you. Next. Everyone second guesses their worst days at work. Mountain View Deputy Fire Chief Sterling Holden was willing to do it out loud with us today so that we can all better understand the choices that faced them as the Marshall Fire rode the wind through Superior. Here's Marshall Zellinger. Yes, sir, we do have a small fire. It's uh, just south of Marshall Road on Highway 93. I think I got there around 1115, 1120, somewhere in there. This video was recorded around the same time Sterling Folden arrived at the Marshall Fire. The way that I approached from, you couldn't see much because of smoke and dirt that was blowing so much. Um, so it was hard to see past the hood at the time. Folden is the deputy chief of Mountain View Fire and Rescue. But on December 30th, he was acting chief and among the first on scene where the fire started. It happened that fast that arrive on the fire, get a little situational awareness, have a quick conversation that there's fire behind us. And I turn around and there's fire going across the road I just came in on. He had come from the east where the fire had already moved. Within minutes, he was evacuating people in Marshall and trying to game plan for a fire playing by different rules. That thought in my head didn't really hit me that the original town superior is like going to be gone, right? That, that never that never triggered on me at, that soon in the event. Instead of saving a home, I'm trying to save a block of homes or I'm trying to save a town at this point. As the fire reached superior, his focus turned to continuity of government. You kind of make this mind change of like town survival all of a sudden, you know, and how do we keep town hall functioning because all their records and their servers and all those things are, are in there and so we need to dedicate resource to that. And when you have extremely limited resources and I'm counting the number of engines I was able to use on one hand, it's tough, it's tough to make those decisions. Another tough decision was to protect what could be an even bigger hazard. If I let this building go, will it cause a hazmat situation that we have to clean up for days or months? For instance, the Tesla dealer, and I'm sure people question why we did that, right? But with all the batteries and everything, that's a large hazmat situation if, that, if all those cars catch fire and it starts to burn. The game plan ended up being truly is notify people of what's happening and don't get anybody hurt if possible. Folden told me he has spent several nights awake in bed thinking of what he could do differently. And he told me not a lot from the get-go. He did talk to me about some of the challenges, though, not being able to see past the hood of his car. So much radio traffic, it was hard to communicate clearly and effectively and communication with other agencies that were helping out. But again, with the fire as fast and dangerous, the fact that we aren't talking about more injuries or death, Kyle, that's a testament to his work and the other fire crews who responded. Yep, I, I remember that first night, that Thursday night when we were out there, we could witness some of that, watch some of their saves that had happened. And when I drove by that Tesla plant, uh, that Tesla uh, facility, I know I've told you this, rolled down my window to take a picture of firefighters defending it. It had some damage. And whatever had burned there smelled about as funky as anything that I smelled that day. It's interesting to hear from him that he knows that people are probably like, why did any effort be made on that business? But to have the mindset, like, if we let that burn, we could still today be dealing with a hazard that we could prevent by protecting it two mm -hmm. weeks earlier. Mm -hmm. Marshall, thank you. So less than three weeks after the Marshall Fire forced the evacuation of every single patient and employee at Avista Adventist Hospital in Louisville, it's preparing to reopen. Hospital's been closed since December 30th when 51 patients had to go and fast. It'll reopen next Tuesday after it's had a full industrial cleaning to try and take the smoke damage out of the interior. We talk about how COVID case numbers are not the best gauge of the pandemic because so many cases are mild. Well, as never as true as it's been right now, with Omicron surging and with at-home tests not being reported as positive cases. Our Mark Salinger looks at why case numbers may not matter at this point in the pandemic. The tests keep piling up. 
More are coming back positive. That's somewhere probably between 1 in 10 and 1 in 15 Coloradans is actively infectious with COVID-19. Countless people have tested positive with at-home tests. Yep, the number is countless because not a whole lot of people are reporting their results to the state. In the past month, less than 4,000 people reported their at-home test results. That's not even a third of the average number of people who tested positive at a testing site over the past week. We know that there's been substantial underreporting of the true number of cases. And then this is really why we rely on multiple data sources for us to have good situational awareness. And Dr. Rachel Herlihy is the Colorado State epidemiologist. We wanted to know how the lack of reporting from at-home tests impacts her decisions on which direction the state should go when it comes to COVID. Spoiler alert. When there are already 13,000 positive tests a day, we already know the virus is pretty much everywhere. But honestly, most important is for individuals to act on those test results so we don't have that next generation of cases occurring. Beyond reporting the data, at-home tests give people an opportunity to isolate before infecting others. The positivity rate and number of cases is already insanely high. At-home tests' main purpose isn't for data. They're used to let people know when to stay home. I think at this point, what people really need to understand is that prevalence of this infection is really high. So what about contact tracing? When this many people are getting infected, the state can't keep up, even if you are reporting your results. We have had to prioritize case investigation and contact tracing activities um, to higher risk settings. For next, I'm Mark Salinger. If you choose to report your at-home rapid test results of the state, it's considered a suspected case, and it's not counted in the state's calculation of confirmed cases and the test positivity rate. That number, by the way, is through the roof. The seven-day positivity average without those at-home tests is just under 30%, 29.6% of tests coming back hot for COVID right now. Typically, this is where we show you the hospitalization numbers each night for an idea of how many serious cases we have. But it appears that that measure of the pandemic is becoming about as useless as case numbers. And here's why. Last night, you heard UC Health say on this program that only about a third of their COVID patients are hospitalized solely for COVID. So we have to rethink our approach to holding hospitalizations up as the best measure of the severity of the pandemic in Colorado. We know the leading variant is less severe and more easily transmitted. So when you've got the majority of people in UC Health System there for something other than COVID, when they're COVID positive, that's pretty important. Though we have to keep in mind, those patients still do need specialized care. Here again is state epidemiologist Rachel Hurley on that. Even if someone has a primary diagnosis of something other than COVID-19, COVID-19 is still complicating their hospitalization for a variety of reasons, either making them more ill and extending the length of their hospitalization or making it more challenging for our healthcare providers to provide care to those individuals. She got people who are in for like a broken arm, but if they come back hot for COVID, then they have to be isolated for, from other patients. That takes hospital resources, straining the system with the number of staff vacancies. Long way of saying, it's clear that we can't keep putting up the hospitalization numbers each night and comparing them to, say, six months ago because it's no longer an apples-to-apples -apples situation. That's so why we're going to start focusing on hospital capacity, hoping that this is a useful measure to tell us the seriousness of the situation. So you look at ICU beds. Right now, there are 122 ICU beds available in Colorado, so 92% of ICU beds in Colorado are currently occupied. You don't want them all empty. That's not how hospitals are built, but we have to be careful it starts to get right up at the top side of the range. State legislators went back to work today, and hey, terrific news. Democrats who hold the majority and Republicans who are in the minority agree. They agree on the biggest issues facing the state. Cost of living, rising crime, and education reform. How encouraging is that to start our legislative session with bipartisan agreement? Democrats have created such a political mess for themselves that they are now copying and pasting the same priorities that we Republicans announced in August. We were mocked then and told that we were that there were more important issues. Hmm more important issues facing Coloradans. Yet six months later, Democrats appear to be on board with our three major issues. Okay, so the Republicans are big mad that the Democrats are focusing on the same issues of importance to Colorado. Democratic leaders told us that they are certainly open to Republicans' proposals on these things if they would like to work together on them.
I know Republicans have come and talked to uh, me uh, about uh, any of their ideas. So I think my concern is that when I talk to individual Republicans, uh, those aren't the issues that they're talking to me about. And no one's come to me with any uh, any proposals uh, that they um, have been tweeting about over the last week. So I welcome it. My door is always open. Um, these are the issues that Coloradans are focused on and, and that we're going to deliver on. And I'm happy to you know, entertain any good idea. So this session is likely to shape up like the last, just because of pure numbers, Democrats have the votes to pass their ideas, unless a few Democrats decide to vote against their party's priorities. Or if Democratic Governor Jared Polis signals that he's not on board and might issue a veto. So, hey, I've been looking around to see where we might be able to still help our neighbors impacted by the Marshall Fire. Your last word of thanks campaign raised $2 million to help with immediate needs like short-term housing and then longer-term needs like mental health support. We have not talked as much about the fire's impact on Coloradans' pets. And that is why this week's Word of Thanks microgiving campaign supports the Humane Society of Boulder Valley. They helped care for pets rescued and injured in the fire. And they're providing long-term boarding and even foster care options if needed for families who are forced from their homes and are now living in places where their beloved pets are not allowed to come with them. The nonprofit is even covering the expense of pet deposits for people suddenly forced to pay extra to keep their pets with them in rental housing. And the nonprofit's providing pet food and supplies for displaced families. Because of your word of thanks donations this week, the Humane Society of Boulder Valley is going to be able to continue that important work, along with its safety net program, providing pet care for families who can't afford it. And they're going to be able to make two additional promises to the thousands of Coloradans who lost their homes in the Marshall Fire. They're going to offer free boarding services for those families whenever they need it in the coming year, if at any point they end up living somewhere that they can't bring their pet along. And for all the families that lost pets in the Marshall Fire, your donations are going to cover all of the adoption fees at the Humane Society of Boulder Valley if those families choose to bring the love of a pet back into their lives. Scan the QR code on your screen or text the word thanks to 303-871-1491 and I'll send you that link to donate. Sometimes the text function gets wonky. The QR code, which size is on? There it is. Works every time. As always, even $5 helps, so I'll match the first 50 people who give $5 to get us started. Our hearts go out to all the families who lost pets they love in that fire. And our thanks goes out to the Humane Society of Boulder Valley for taking care of the pets that survived. <laughs> You've been asking about the lack of masks at the stock show. Yet yeah, Denver Public Health is aware of that, but they are not about to lower the boom. And the story of an escape from the Marshall Fire. I think we did the right thing, just get dogs in the car, get people in the car, babies and stuff, and then just get the heck out of there. She was stranded. Two kids, no car, fire approaching the house. The story of how they got out. Next. May we all approach the loss in our lives with the same positive attitude and perspective as Ruth Lincoln and her family in Louisville. The fire took about everything from them, except a couch, one lonely couch. The reason the couch survived is because they were trying to get rid of it. They loaded onto a trailer the morning of the fire. They're going to take it to Goodwill. Now the couch is all they have left. So the family decided to have some fun with it. They posed for a family photo on the couch in front of the burned out shell of what once was their home. Everything was a loss there, but we had each other. We had all of us, and that to me was, you know, the most important thing. And we had the silly couch. The person who took the photo for him lives across the street in a home that was not touched by the fire. As it turned out, that neighbor needed a couch, so now they have one. High clouds are streaming into Colorado on the northwest flow ahead of a storm that will bring snow to the high country starting tomorrow and then to Denver on Friday. Temperatures tomorrow will be the warmest day of the week, similar to today, upper 50s, low 60s. These numbers some 15 degrees above average. But cold air is coming in from the north, combining with that moisture off to the west, and we'll start to see some changes about midday tomorrow. High and mid-level clouds will start to stream in, and then we'll start to see the snow fly in the high country by tomorrow night. Tomorrow, we got a temperature close to 60 degrees. Then Friday will be cloudy, windy, and colder with temperatures in the lower 40s and a 20 to 30 percent chance of snow. We clear out Saturday, then kick off a new warming trend. Sunshine and 50s for the holiday Monday and first part of next week. 
National Western Stock Show, where the animals have to be vaccinated, but the people do not, is halfway through its first week. Denver's health department says it currently has 10 formal complaints about people refusing to follow the city's mask rules indoors at the stock show. We told you how the city had met with stock show leaders after the National Western made it clear it wasn't really going to enforce the mask rules. Denver's health department says it continues to focus not on fining anybody or anything like that, but trying to encourage voluntary buy-in with the city's rules. A mother was at home in Superior with two young kids and without a car when that fire started closing in. It was, it was terrifying, but we are so thankful that Jared came and that he knew exactly where to go to keep us safe. He came to their rescue before the fire swept over. Next. Acts of generosity and bravery continue to emerge following the Marshall Fire. One family who lost the rental house they called home in Superior experienced both. We spoke to him in Denver, where a generous stranger is letting them stay while they figure out what is next and while they deal with what they've been through. We went back once to look at the house. I mean, there's nothing there. You're not going to salvage anything. We've got a few little like, ornament memento stuff that made it through. but Just to see the destruction was just, I mean, you, it's hard to explain that feeling. So I'm Ashley, and this is Jer, and our baby Dylan. The day of the fire, I was home watching um, Dylan, of course, and then another baby that I watched. And Jer had gone to work in the morning. Um, I smelled smoke around, I think it was, it was around noon, um, and saw online that there was a <laughs> grass, grass fire. Didn't think it was anything, any big deal. I texted Jer to let him know. It was maybe 10 minutes after I started smelling smoke. Our whole neighborhood was like black and yellow smoke. Like, I don't have a car. And with the winds and how fast it was moving, I knew it was going to be bad. So it was just kind of get home, get them, and then like get out of the path of it. So As soon as I started to panic, I looked out the window um, upstairs and Jarrett like was racing down the road and um, into the driveway. I think we did the right thing. Just get dogs were in the car, get the people in the car, babies and stuff, and then just get the heck out of there. She happens to say to me like, because we're like two minutes away from the house, she's like, did you happen to blow the candle out? And I'm like, God, babe. <laughs> I think, I think, the things I, you think I of. didn't, but I, I think it'll be okay. <laughs> We were kind of looking through what was left and one of the only recognizable things was a little ornament that said, how long will I love you as long as there are stars above you? It pretty much symbolizes like what's, what's helping us get through this to so our love and our love for our little family and the love that we're shown from the community and our family and friends. Jerry and Ashley just started talking about what is next for their family. They may move back to Boulder County or they may head back east to be closer to other family members. Caring for pets impacted by the Marshall Fire and helping the families that lost pets and homes in the same awful moment. We'll have that right after you sign up for your county's emergency alerts. Do it during the break. It's fast, please. I can't tell you how many Coloradans lost family pets in the Marshall Fire. We simply don't know. What I can tell you is that the Humane Society of Boulder Valley has said, when they are ready, we'll be here for them. Your Word of Thanks microgiving campaign this week will cover pet adoption fees for any of the displaced families when they know they're ready for a pet again. It's also going to fund the Humane Society's commitment to cover boarding costs for any displaced family who can't keep their pet with them in temporary housing anytime between now and when their house is rebuilt. Extra funding is going to cover pet food and supplies for the impacted families and also go to the Humane Society's safety net program for families in Boulder County who cannot afford vet care. Scan the QR code on your screen or text the word thanks to 303-871-1491 to join me in giving. Your generosity is legendary, so it is really no surprise that you have raised $40,000 in 15 minutes. Keith writes in tonight about the high number of COVID-positive hospitalizations in Colorado. We talked tonight about how there's so many people in the hospital and just happen to be testing positive for COVID while they're there for something else that that's not a useful number for us to report anymore. Keith says it's hospitals gaming the system. You can't say that healthcare workers are heroes and scam artists, Keith.